Good morning. I'm delighted and honored to celebrate 50 years of SPRU, Science Policy Research Unit Review. But let me ask you a question. What is the future of science, technology and innovation policy? What should we concentrate on and what should SPRU do in the future? And to assess this, I think we need to do something which Spru always does, that is looking to the outside world. And when we do that, what do we see? We see, I call it, Paul called it crisis, a world in crisis. I call it a world in transition. And there are four ways of talking that I would like to introduce to you, four ways of thinking and talking about this world in transition. The first one is in terms of megatrends. The second one in terms of grand challenges, you will recognize this. And then transforming innovation. Transforming innovation is the SPRU strategy, is the label for the SPRU strategy for the future. And then deep transitions, which is, relates to my own work. And I will introduce all four. These are the mecha trends. You can point to more. And of course, in the UK, we are very much concerned with Brexit. Not only in the UK, I think in the world. And we focus a lot now on the consequences of Brexit. But I think we should focus more on the causes. So what caused Brexit? These megatrends are certainly part of the answer. And I think we, all innovation scholars, and people working, policy makers, should think about how we can contribute to dealing with these megatrends. Well, the UN, last year, defined a number of sustainable development goals. And this is a remarkable achievement, I think, because of the broad scope. But I would like to make two remarks about these. One is that these goals are shared among the developing and the developed world. We have all signed up. And this is significant because, in a way, this distinction does not hold anymore. I think we are all developing. And this is, has a very important consequences to think that way, and I will come back to that. Uh, but we're all in the same boat, and uh, we should act that way. Uh, the second remark has to do with the notion of social progress. Because we have lost the ability in our community sometimes to talk about social progress. And I think we should get back in that territory. So I'm very pleased that Ameti Sen took the initiative to set up the International Panel on Social Progress, which is a complement to the International Panel on Climate Change, to write a big report with 300 scholars about the state of the art in the world in social progress. And SPRU is coordinating the innovation bit of this. So check it out. There will be a session tomorrow about this. Well, there's a third way of talking about the world in transition, which is transforming innovation. And this notion is connected to the old Schumpeterian notion of creative destruction. Because we always had the idea that innovation might have consequences, bad consequences for employment, for example, so loss of jobs, but somehow it will make up for it because we will end up with more jobs, higher quality jobs in the end. So there is what you might call collateral damage, but there's also creation. And the creation part makes up for the destruction part. And then, because we have the creation, we generate economic growth, we can tax the people producing economic growth and the organizations, then we have income, and then we can deal with poverty. We can deal with the distribution function of the economy. 
That's the way the modern welfare state is built. And innovation is key. So innovation is key to capitalism, is key to modernity. It's a motor, a driving force in this story. The trouble is, perhaps, nowadays, the destructive part is bigger than the creative part. So innovation is causing, is having consequences that are bigger than can be somehow dealt with. It's a question mark. Luc Sutter, the new chair of uh, the SPRU advisory group, coined the term destructive creation to refer to this. So within SPRU, our strategy mainly is we want to focus at the power of innovation to reform capitalism, to reform the modernization process. So we believe that innovation is a venue, an avenue, a site to work on this. But we also believe that we need to change the way we innovate. The old ways will lead to more destruction than creation. There's a fourth way of talking about the world in transition, which uh, I coined deep transition together with Lauer Kanga. I worked on this paper over the summer. The basic idea is this. Our society, capitalism and modernity, it has a material backbone. And this material backbone is a set of what we call socio-technical systems. And these socio-technical systems shape and drive a lot of developments, almost on a routine basis. So it's very difficult, for example, to achieve sustainable development because these systems provoke unsustainable behavior. So what we need is not a change of one system, but a change of many systems, and in a similar direction. And this is massive. So you could say that we lift a first deep transition which is the industrialization process. And now we might move to a second deep transition and we're just starting. But that's what we should work on. This world on transition is a movement towards a second deep transition. Let me explain a bit more the notion of system because this is key to me for the innovation policy. Because a system means a set of elements and it means that innovation policy, for example, this is an example of the mobility system, should not only focus on the vehicle, on the infrastructure, but also should focus on values, on culture. So innovation policy is about all these elements, and it's about the alignment between the elements. It's not about the individual elements, but the alignment. And let me visualize this. This is a car in the Netherlands. That's the country where I come from. And as you can see, this car gets nowhere. And it's not because the Dutch were catching up to the UK at the end of the 19th century. It's because there was no system. So we still had to invent how to use the car. For example, going on holiday with car had to be invented. To embed the car in our value system had to be, embed, had to be invented. And this is crucial for understanding the success of the car. As we know, the car was very successful. And this is a picture of Rotterdam, the town I grew up in. And again, the car is stuck. It gets nowhere. The system is built around it. So the system is there. But this is to illustrate we need new systems. And what will not help is traffic management. Because that's what we call system optimization. We need radical system change. So this is what the world demands. So we need to work with the mega trends. We cannot change them in the short term. We need to address the grand challenges, modify the innovation engine, so transform innovation towards a deep transition of multi-social technical systems and avoiding war. Because we have to remember that the welfare state in the West came after a bloody first part of the 20th century. And the wars were important to create direction in the economy and in society. So this is an urgent issue. And therefore the word crisis 
is perhaps a good word to think about it. So we, innovation scholars, should also really think about the military aspects and wars. And not just when people working on sustainability, we tend to think about the nice things that could happen. And we should include this in a, into our analysis. Okay, now I come back to uh, science, technology, and innovation policy. Ed Steinmiller and I have been working on a paper, again over the summer, I've been busy, uh, developing this notion of three frames of science, technology, innovation policies. These are three ways of addressing this world in transition. And two ways are already quite dominant, and Spru has been very instrumental to putting them in place. But there's a third way, which we call transformative change, which we think is very important for science, technology, and innovation policy to think about. And this thinking has been developed, I said, writing a paper, yes, but we've done that throughout the year in working with many people in Spru, I mentioned a few here, but also working in Africa and in Latin America and in China with policymakers. So giving presentations, having workshops, we had at Spru uh, Engagement Week in Africa, uh, we worked in uh, Colombia discussing with policymakers these notions. So let me introduce the three frames. The first frame, I think you all know about this, of course, is the idea that we need R&D investment to grow the economy. And it's not happening because of market failure, because firms don't have this kind of long-term perspective. So the state needs to step in and provide funding. And then it's about the relationship between the state and the market. The focus here is on knowledge production, breakthrough, novelty, high tech. The actors are the state and the market and firms, and often big firms. So these are the policy activities. You will recognize them. I will not go into detail here, uh, but these are typical policy uh, activities. For example, science communication is about getting support for investment, uh, but it's not about the investment itself, the nature of the investment. There's foresight, yes, but foresight is about setting priorities. This is the model it's based on, the linear model. Uh, and again, you will recognize it. This model was criticized because, as it turned out, you can invest a lot in R&D, but you're not better. The outcome, you're not more competitive. So how can we explain that some economies are doing better with less investment in R&D? Well, the answer was because they have a better national system of innovation or a different national system of innovation. And this insight was, among others, developed by Chris Freeman. He went to Japan to find out why the Japanese, and specifically the car industry, could beat the Americans. And they came up, he came up with this notion of national system of innovation, which was then developed, and is now state of the art. When the OECD goes out to do a report on the policy, science, technology, innovation policy of a country, they will use this framework, national system of innovation, to assess the state of the art. And it's basically about the links, the links between all the actors. So it's system failure. They're looking for systems failure and to repair them to build the links between the actors. The focus is not only on breakthrough R&D, the focus is also on incremental innovation. Even hidden innovation, a, a term coined as far as I know, also by Spru. Uh, so it's about improvement. And there are a lot more actors in the frame. There's universities, there's also users, there's intermediaries, there's a whole set of relationships that need to be built. And this also explains why we have varieties. Because depending on the links built, you will have a separate technological trajectory. 
And here you find the typical policy activities that are part of this frame. And again, you will recognize them. I also want to uh, emphasize here that in this frame, entrepreneurship is very important. Because in the end, it's about absorptive capacity. It's about the ability of the economy to absorb the knowledge produced and make it beneficial, use it, make it productive. So the idea is we need entrepreneurship. And if you think about the linear model, of course, so we move to innovation and diffusion being part you know, of science, technology, and innovation policy, basically. And this is the one representation of the model behind it, the chain-linked model. Again, you will all recognize it. It's about feedbacks, organizing feedbacks between all the activities. Well, let's move to the third frame, which is still emerging. The third frame connects up more with this world in transition, the current world in transition, and makes the point that although we have science, technology, innovation policy, it does not address really, on paper, yes, it does, if you read the policy documents. But if you look at the activities, if you look at the funding, it does not address the social failures and what you might call the environmental failures. So we need a science, technology, and innovation policy addressing these other type of failures. And we also need to do something perhaps revolutionary, is to start talking about bad innovation. Because innovation is always positive. Innovation is good. Innovation is not always good. So how can we make this distinction between bad and good innovation and introduce the idea of directions or directionality, a term coined by Andy Sterling, into the frame. So we argue it's necessary to start thinking about transformative, transformative change. So about, from my perspective, we need to think about system change, about deep transitions. The focus here is not on product innovation, not on process innovation, it's not on R&D, it's on systems, socio-technical systems. And there are a lot more actors in the frame. Because who are innovative in the area of culture connected to innovation? Who are innovative in the, in the, in, in the context of developing a new market? In the Netherlands, I showed you the, the car, there was a Dutch user organization, a tourist organization, that developed a lot of ideas about how to use the car and start to experiment with it. So this is key for this type of innovation policy. So there are a lot more actors that need to be worked with. So it's broadening the scope. So these are the type of policy activities. You will recognize some of them, because some of them have been implemented, have been experimented with. Um, Ari Rip here, also in the room, is, uh, it was very important in the Netherlands in developing the notion of constructive technology assessment, which is a kind of first expression, I would argue, of this type of policy. We need a new innovation model for this. And this picture just wants to clarify that this, inno this innovation model or theory is not yet there. So this is the type of work we need to do. There is the idea of many paths, so variety and perhaps selection, opening up. The system, but there's also another idea here, which is the idea that innovation basically is not about the fusion in the end. Because we might think that England was the cradle of the Industrial Revolution, but as an historian, I would say no. That's a wrong impression. So the whole question, why, did, why was England first? is the wrong question to ask. They were not first. The Industrial Revolution, so the first deep transition, happened because of contributions of many countries globally. Yes, the UK was able to appropriate the knowledge and to put it to a certain use. And that is the same for the second deep transition. 
we will have contributions from many countries that somehow need to come together. So this is not a diffusion model, it's a circulation model. And we really need to think about the appropriation. So who is appropriating the benefits and who, is a, who has to appropriate the bad impacts? So, this is my call to develop this new transformative innovation policy. And therefore, I'm very glad, delighted, to be able to announce here that we have been able to establish a new global consortium that will work on this transformative innovation policy. And here you will find the aim of this global consortium. Okay, we first have here the, who are the founding members? So we have a, a couple of organizations that have signed up for it. And they will sign here today <coughs> as we speak. And we have a number of organizations that are interested perhaps in signing. We are exploring with them whether they could sign up, sign up for it. This is the aim. So we want to explore the foundation, the future and the governance of transformative innovation policy. And the focus is not only on concepts. The focus is also very clearly on implementation, on how to do it. So we want to engage in policy experimentation. Evaluation is important to develop new evaluation practices. And we have been working with Ingenio over the last year already and through for a much longer time to work on this. There's training, which is part of it, and mutual learning. That's a key idea. The idea is not to dump the first two frames, because they are very important. The idea is that all three are important, and we need to find ways how they can work together. Well, here you see a representation of the consortium and the organizations uh, signing up. So, again, it's with great pleasure that I can announce that here today, celebrating 50 years of Sprue, we will start a new adventure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johan. Um, I'm now going to um, call on uh, Professor Michael Davies, the Vice, uh, Pro Vice Chancellor of Research at the University of Sussex, to lead the proceedings. As, as Johan has said, we have um, the, the various partners associated with this, this new venture here today. And I'm going to call them in turn to come forward to, um, to, 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 to sign an, an, uh, 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 an agreement uh, between us. Um, to, to work together, and the foundation partners first, and then the, then the, then the ones who will be joining us later. Um, and at, each will sign, sign using a special pen, which I think Johan's got there, ready to go, and, and will say a, a few words um, um, ab about their commitment to, to this venture. So perhaps without further ado, the first one I should really call is Professor Johan Schott, who is Director of SPRU. Johan. We have a special pen for this, a Sprue anniversary pen that uh, all the organizations will get that sign, sign up for this. <laughs> a special offer. <laughs> uh, we now ask for a representative of the Research Council of Norway, Elizabeth Gelbranson, uh, to come and sign, please, Elizabeth. Keep it. The Research Council of Norway is 
and will always be an organization for learning. But we have experienced these last years that we also have to become much more of a learning organization. And this uh, transformative innovation policy consortium is an opportunity and a space for us for continued learning and development. And that will happen through some very challenging, I think, a crossover collaboration in and between the partners. So a big thank is due to Johan and his team here at SPRU for inviting us not just to rethink innovation and innovation policy, but also to reinvent and co-invent it. So, I'm looking very much forward, for, forward to the conference, and happy anniversary to SPRU. Thank you. Now signing on behalf of the South African National Research Foundation is Vinny Pillay. to be a founding member of this uh, pioneering consortium, of course, bringing together thought leaders and actors from across the globe. I think, as Johan mentioned in his presentation earlier, the multitude of challenges that we face today are global, climate change, food security, innovation, and I think this initiative is timely. Within the South African context, we, having celebrated 20 years of democracy in 2014, also in a process of reflection. We're currently busy um, redrafting and reviewing our uh, white paper on science, technology, and innovation, of which SPRU is very um, involved in as well. And I also think we are reflecting in terms of our institutional mechanisms, but also our policy um, initiatives, and that I think is important for us. Um, one of the other things that South Africa is very committed to is um, we've released our National Development Plan, which sets out a vision 2030. And there's huge acknowledgement from government um, and our important institutional partners of the role of science, technology, and innovation, and the role it plays in making a positive impact on people's lives. And I think ultimately, that's the key driver for us in terms of these systems we'd like, like to really look at. And of course, this consortium presents an important opportunity for us to learn, learn by doing, and also implementing. And I think it's a fitting uh, initiative to celebrate SPRU's 50th anniversary. And I must congratulate and thank you, Han, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Our final founder member signatory is um, the Colombian Administrative Department of Science, Technology and Innovation. And here to sign their first half is Dr. Alejandro Olea Davilia. When I started talking with Johan about this concept, uh, a war in transition, we automatically do some click because my work, the Colombian war, is in deepest transition in his modern history. We are facing uh, the sign of a peace agreement with the guerrillas of Colombia. A 50 years of armed conflict is proximate to end in our country. And our country is going to, has to rethink all these new society in a peace moment. And we deeply believe that policy innovation must have a specific role in these transitions of our society. And we are grateful to Johan on the, our founding members to this invitation to build together and to learn at this magnificent theme of our transition moment. Thank you. So we have our fo photo moment together. <laughs> so 
this lady? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Let me let me be in the. I'm I'm tall. <laughs> Thank you. We have the three um, potential members uh, or people who expressed interest in joining us, and I hope they will join us, um, um, who will be signing, signing now. And the first representing the, uh, the Chinese Academy of Science and Technology for Development is Hei Wangji. My institute uh, CASTED, which means Chinese Academy of uh, Science and Technology for Development, is a policy research institute uh, under the Ministry of Science and Technology of China. Uh, CASTED appreciates the uh, SPRU and the con consortium's uh, proposal to, to uh, develop a more inclusive and more uh, sustainable uh, innovation policy uh, model. So, and we think it's uh, uh, consistent uh, with the, the idea and the orientation of Chinese government's innovation uh, policy making. And uh, we believe it will uh, be of great help to uh, promoting the level of research and uh, implement uh, of uh, innovation uh, policy in China. Thanks again uh, for inviting us to join. Thank you. The, the second signatory is the, uh, the Swedish Government Agency of Innovation Systems, or Vinova. I'm very pleased to invite um, Goran Macklin, Macklin to come and uh, sign. Goran. One. Yeah, uh, we know by the Swedish governmental agency for innovation, so I'm a policymaker, and as a policymaker, uh, we're indeed very interested in, uh, in this uh, initiative. Uh, we think uh, we're convinced for all the reasons that uh, Johan also told us about uh, a couple of minutes ago, that the social societal challenges are really pressing globally, but they are also very pressing in a country like Sweden. And uh, policy lack a lot of the frame frames needed for, for understanding and dealing with this. Uh, we need uh, a new framework, we need uh, the new, uh, new concepts, we need new tools, new understanding which I think add to, uh, to the ones we already have. Uh, so we very much welcome this initiative and I would be very surprised if we wouldn't sign it before Christmas. But uh, I think we will all do our best not to end up in such a situation and I rely on Sprue for taking this that far. Thank you very much. Last but by no means least is the Finnish Funding Agency for Innovation, or TECES, and here to sign their behalf is Mika Lotanala. Well, he's not, oh, here, he's not here, okay. but he has already signed. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, he sent it by email. Okay, so we already have the signature. So we will now do a, another photo moment with all the uh, partners pot and potential partners. So can you, and perhaps yeah. Michael and Paul, you also join. Please, could, yeah. let's see. Thank you. Thank you. 